All right, Von Cash Show. How's it going, everyone? Today with me, I have a guest. It goes by really cool name, Hustle Brand. How's it going, man? Hustle Brand. It goes, it goes. Oh, shit. It goes, it goes. <laughs> good, good. Nice to catch up with you. Um, I met him in a CSUN Hip Hop Culture Club a couple years ago. And uh, yeah, you know, uh, he's a producer. He raps too, but uh, lately he's been on that producing game. Yep. Uh, so, you know, what age did you start playing music? Because I know that you're a music major, right? Yeah, I'm classically trained. Uh, I started playing piano when I was like three or four, but as a kid, when I would play piano, uh, for my lessons, I wouldn't practice the sheet music because mm. it was like, it was like Mary had a little lamb or right. like jingle bells. So it was right. like it was monophonic, which basically means you just play one note at a time. And so I wouldn't practice it because I was like tough shit little four year old, right. like you know, like I need to practice the piano. And right. so my parents took me out of lessons, and so I didn't play music until I was like back into like middle school and like high school when I got back into it. And I only when I started going to CSUN got a piano back because I had a piano in my house when I was like a kid. But when they took me out of lessons, they, like, got it demolished. Oh. Like, straight, like, busted it into pieces. Like, those things, yo, pianos are heavy. Like, yeah. people don't know, but pianos are for real heavy. They got, like, huge, like, plates of metal in them. Mm -hmm. So, like, just to move them, you have to get, like, eight people to try and, like, carry little bits. And they, like, brought it outside, and they were, like, smashing it with sledgehammers. Just throw it in the back of a truck, dude. That's crazy. Yeah. I was, like, 12, like, oh, no, my piano. Like, yeah. Yeah, because I feel like you're musically inclined because to be a music major in CSUN, you have to A, learn how to know how to sing, yeah, or B, uh, play an instrument. Yeah, I do both. Um, actually, I'm in the university choir. Uh, this is my third year with uh, CSUN's choir. I, I did choir at uh, Moore Park Community College before this, but um, I wasn't like an actual college student when I was going there. I was like a high school student just taking classes at the same time. I was concurrently enrolled, as the dean would say. Right. But uh, yeah, no, I've been doing that for a while. Uh, I wasn't really that good at piano before I started coming here. Like I've been producing for like a long time now, but actually physically playing piano, I like started playing it a month, like a month before I started going to CSUN. So I had like cram to like make it into the entrance exams. That's I thought, crazy. Yeah, I thought they weren't gonna let me in, but then you know they got back to me. They're like, yeah, you're accepted in the department. And I was, whew, I was wiling out. I was so stoked. Dude, I didn't know you're in the choir. What? Yeah, dude, I'm in the choir. You We're doing a show CSUN on December second. Yeah, I'm a baritone. I what does well, that I mean? sing. I basically when it comes down to choral works. You have sopranos, altos, tenors, and basses, which are like the vocal ranges. And so like sopranos the top and like basses the bottom. And then in between bass and tenor is like baritones. Okay. So when there's no basses singing in our choir, I'll like sing the tenor line in like a falsetto voice. Um, because this semester we only have like five or six people in the tenors and it's so it's like kind of unevenly split. So I'm doing that to like help out the professor. I had no idea. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, because uh, I actually, before becoming Asian American Studies, or no, before being business marketing, I think mm -hmm. I even I tried to apply for music mm -hmm. for the music uh, major because I mean I don't play any instruments or sing, but yeah. I figured I could learn some music industry stuff. Mm -hmm. But being a music major off the bat, you have to know how to sing. Yeah, and uh, and play instruments. Was it rigorous? Was it com was it rigorous to get in? Honestly, with choir and everything, I was I went to when I started going to community college. It was so that I could work on like production and stuff because I was really into doing that. I was in like tenth, eleventh grade. You know, I just like not I didn't drop out of high school, but I left a regular high school to go to an independent study school so that I could focus on like music and shit. And when I was there taking classes at Moore Park, which was the community college near me, I had to take a class called musicianship it was the first like basic class it's just really like simplest like uh, like you know like a rock could do it kind of like singing where it's just like simple scales and stuff and I just I had to do a, a something one day for like an exam and I actually sang it like an octave lower which is just like pitched down way further than it should have been and mm -hmm. so these girls in my class were like oh my god you can sing so low we need basses in our choir blah 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 so these like seven girls after class like I was just trying to go home I wasn't like I was like nah I'm not a singer I don't do that like but they like ganged up around me they surrounded me and like like herded me like like a cattle or something over to the choir professor's uh, room and they were like oh he's gonna join choir he's like another bass and then he was like oh, okay what's your name sign this stuff right here I was like uh, 
I'm Ian. Uh, all right, I guess. Yeah. Uh, here I am. And then, so they threw me into it, and then I just kind of got started like that. And so, even though I didn't have experience, it kind of like developed me a little bit at Moore Park. So I had like basic fundamental skills, so that when I went to CSUN, I had like the the basics kind of down, so I right. could like kind of pick up on like where they were like you know going but the students here dude they've been like practicing since they were like two years old rigorously like 10 hours a day they're like on a whole nother level so i had to do like a lot of catch-up work oh, when yeah. i started going here it's like f- metaphorically speaking you have to go to the meta you have to go to the what is it called the um like in um the hyperbolic med- the time chamber. Yeah, the hyperbolic <laughs> hey, time chamber. You, you know what it is. Mind. Hey, you know, and right now we're in the hyperbolic rhyme chamber. Wow. Burr, 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 burr. Hey, hey. <laughs> wow, man. <laughs> you, I forgot what that was called. Yeah. Uh, on a tangent, do you watch Dragon Ball Super? You know, I know I've watched some of the Dragon Balls. I like Dragon Ball Z, but I was never a huge fan of it because the progression in the shows takes so long I dude mean, and as a kid like my attention span was like barely enough for naruto so yeah like, i mean there would be some episodes where like all you hear is napa just screaming yeah or like they would they would extend a fight that's like 10 minutes into like six 20 minute yeah. long episodes a lot of stare downs and, yeah there's like there's that literally physically would take way less time so it's like it doesn't make sense when they have like an hour's worth of dialogue in what's supposed to be like 10 minutes yeah um i will say Dragon Ball Super is a lot more fast paced, mm-hmm. um, but I, I do agree. I that's mean, the, that's the one with the new like the the cat dude, the purple. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, he's a death he's god. Like, mm-hmm. He's a death god. Um, it's really good. Um, but back to this. Um, what are your earliest memories of listening to music? You know, my dad when I was a little like really little kid, um, even before I was like born, my dad was in this group called Cerberus, which was like a like a I guess like a prog rock group from back in the days that were kind of big but then he like stopped doing that and then he did like a more solo prog rock project with a couple other people featured called like systems theory mm-hmm. and apparently I didn't know until I was like older but it was super big in like Japan and like China like his wow. music got pirated like hundreds of thousands of times in there like during the early 2000s and stuff and so when I was like three or four I remember going to a prog rock music festival with my dad and like he gave me these like shitty earplugs that I wouldn't ruin my hearing, and like I I didn't know anything. I was like, oh yeah, you know my dad makes music or whatever. Like you know, like it's not a big deal kind of thing. But like, so many Asian people came up to him and were like, oh my god, like your music, blah blah. Can I get a signature and all this and that? And like, no one I knew like knew about his music. You know what I mean? So I was like, when I was a kid there, I was like so confused. I was like, what like people know my dad's stuff and then like later on you know like he explained it to me like as I got older and I was like you know we could have like been living in like Japan you know my dad would have been like uh more like a like a celebrity kind of guy but he decided to like stay in California and like really like get like a solid job so Mm. like so I'm like my family had like you know he he was trying to like raise a family right you know as opposed to like you know bringing us out there and then having him like do like touring stuff and like stuff like that do you believe that or do you think that like uh, the music traits that your dad has was passed on to you through genes or just because you're around him all the time? I mean, it's your dad, obviously. Oh, uh, dude, not like, he, like, I didn't play music with my dad ever. He he produced, like, most of that stuff because he played guitar and, like, sang back in, like, the 70s when he came from, because he's from England, so he came, like, uh, when he was, like, 16 or 17, he was, like, in a band doing all that stuff. But really, like, I didn't really do music stuff with my dad very much and when I was like a kid like he stopped really pursuing that project after his uh, one of his like best friends died of cancer around 2004 or so Mm -hmm. and so like really my musical inclination I feel like it comes from the fact that when I was in like seventh or eighth grade one of my friends was like producing a song and I was just like captivated like I tried to use FO studio and stuff before but like I was absolute garbage and I had never seen anyone do it. But when I saw this guy, like he just was slapping through it, you know, like easily could just boom, 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 you know, press a couple buttons and suddenly like he had like whole beats done. And I was just like totally mesmerized. I was like, I gotta do this. I gotta check this out. But really like my family wasn't really like pushing me to do like music and stuff Mm -hmm. until like I was like pursuing it on my own going like college. Like I was in concert band in like middle school and stuff like that. Same with my brother, but they were never like too like, they weren't like, oh, you know, y'all are going to be musicians. You know, right, they, my right. mom thought I was going to like, 
be like a programmer or something, but I just took a quick 180 on that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy, man. Yeah. Wow. I had no idea your dad was in a band. And that's, that's it must yes. be like a weird feeling to find out later on your dad was like, you know, he, he had, yeah, he was popping. He had a bunch of clout. He had clout in Japan. He had, he had old school clout. <laughs> he had old you know school what I mean? clout. Like, you yeah. know, he, he doesn't have like the new school, like clout, like us with like, you know, the, the white lenses, oh, you know, the Kurt the Cobain glasses. glasses. Oh yeah. my God. No one even knows that that was Kurt Cobain's thing. Like Come he like influenced. You're right. Yeah. Those were Kurt Cobain Nirvana. Glasses. That was a Nirvana thing. And then it Miko's picked up on them and people were like, you know, it's crazy how the internet takes like memes and stuff and yeah. takes something that's originally like one concept and degrades it down into like mm. something that's so like not related but so recognizable around yeah. the globe. Like you say clout goggles to anybody on campus they're gonna be like oh yeah I know what you're talking about they're gonna yeah. like do like a weird like you know motion with their hands be like you know like the circle yeah. glasses with the either white yeah and it's like uh, you know all these Mia Khalifa memes anyone like oh everyone <laughs> knows who that is I'm not gonna say who it is but everybody or a lot of guys know they can re- recognize and, and her a, and a lot of girls yeah a lot yeah, of girls right. know who Mia Khalifa is yeah. too, you know? Um, it was there's this one meme where it's like, if you recognize her smile, like you're not going to heaven <laughs> kind of shit. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's no. like you like it's crazy. You know like this girl's smile. Mm-hmm. And you're like just looking at her smile, you already know who it is. Oh yeah. It's crazy how the internet works. Yeah. Um so <laughs> like when did you what was like your first um memories of like the radio like when you put on the radio your like parents or brother put on the radio what do you remember first hearing or like what got you into ra- listening to radio you know radio i wasn't ever like the hugest fan of like the like the airwaves and stuff mm-hmm. i felt like the music they played was all more so like you know my parents were tuned into like the 93 ones so like the 95.5 k rocks okay. which have those like over compressed like indie rock songs you know mm-hmm. but um really i feel like earliest memories i have of like listening to like music over like the car like speakers and stuff would be with my dad coming back from something when I was like three or four out in like LA we're taking like the 405 North and he was listening to Oasis Uh or it wasn't yeah, I think it was like Oasis, you know. And after all, you're my wonder wall. Mm, and it's like right. that British band from like the 70s. And so that's like the earliest memory I have of that kind of like pop British kind of like uh, more like band oriented kind of music. Mm-hmm. But uh, that's not really like, you know, the kind of stuff that I got into like doing, you know, as much as that was like, I guess, influenced me in my younger years. I got more into like that electronic kind of music when I was like, nine or ten you know i was the kind of kid who would like i was in literally elementary school in like second grade and i was like showing kids on campus like pretty rape girl by dj surreal i was like yo wow. this is my jam and like people were like what is this this is garbage and then like years later people were like you know like my friends from like you know back in the day they're like no yeah ian was like up on that like weird electronic shit like way way back then but after like that kind of stuff i you know it progressed more into like hip hop for a while. Yeah. You know, I, I started making like beats, beats before I like. I didn't start off doing the EDM kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, as even though that's where my sounds progressed, I started off doing like hip hop instrumentals because my brother was like he started off as a rapper. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. He was like the first person in our family to take like. I mean, besides my dad, but like between the two of us, my brother really started doing music before I did because he was like trying to do like rap stuff. He like he ghost wrote for like me and my like uh, our friend. Like, when I was, like, in ninth grade, you know, he was like, yo, you guys just rap on this one song. You know, I've got the bars already. You don't even have to, like, write them out. And so we were like, oh, you know, okay. So that's, like, how me and my other friend, he was, uh, his name's Will, but we called him Dr. Ville, like, the mm. villainous doctor. You know, okay, Phil. okay. But, uh, yeah, me and him, you know, that's how we got started rapping. And then, like, obviously that took off. You know, we were doing, like, cypher sessions all the time, you know, just, like, out, like, rapping at, like, parties, mm-hmm. doing shit like that. Nice. And so, like, I got started making beats for us because, you know, I wasn't about to spend, like, a few hundred dollars on, like, a beat or, like, you know, get stuff like that. I was, like, I was broke, you know? I was, right. like, I, if we're getting beats, like, you know, if we want to, like, put out music, we got to, you know, we got to make them ourselves. And so I started making the beats admittedly they were absolute garbage at first and everyone starts out like yeah that. you know right. that's something I, I really want to point out too is like if you're going to start doing music it, you're not going to be great at first a lot of people when they see me now like my dad's always like oh you know i don't have the talent you have and i always have to point out to people that i didn't have talent i don't have talent i was not naturally gifted i wasn't able to just pick this stuff up but you know through hard work and dedication i was able to like practice and like hone my craft more mm-hmm. so so that at this point, you know, I can make out, you know, I can like 
pop out like a, a pop song for you know like a Rihanna type artist or you know I can make like a Night Lavelle type beat for mm-hmm. you know like some sort of underground rap you know the EDM stuff right you're like Sonny Moore's you're like you oh know, my god Skrillex yeah <laughs> yo Skrillex. I fuck with Skrillex like when it was Skrillex <laughs> yeah for first <laughs> to last ring. oh my god back in the day Sonny Moore hear yeah. that name now it's just Skrillex yeah but oh uh, so yeah when first he was last. doing his yeah his like oh. what was the, I wouldn't call it indie music but it like was, more it like it was more like metal like yeah, it was like rock. It, it was like metal. the band kind of stuff, you know. What I oh, mean? that was good. He was yeah. only fifteen at the time. Yeah, dude, and he didn't even. There wasn't like a scene back when he got started. It was like two thousand six, I want to say, when he started making electronic music, and that was just like he just started making music for fun, and then people started like catching on, you mm-hmm. know, in the MySpace era. But you know, think things have changed nowadays. You know, we're yeah. like past the SoundCloud wave. You know, people are already like trying to look on to the next thing. Are we? Out. I think personally, SoundCloud I, has like the way. It, I feel like SoundCloud in like 2012 through like 2014 or 2015 was like popping. It was where it's at, you know. You still have people like Akeem, you know, Lord Sun. Shout Lord out Sun. my boy. Melt coming out on the 18th. Hey. Go cop his new album, you know. L- low key, I'm trying to interview him um, next Wednesday before his shit drops. Yeah, dude, his album's coming out on like, I want to say the 18th, you know. Yeah, I've been Saturday. checking with him. So, yeah, dude. He uh, is, it's just good, you know. He's yeah. progressed from that, uh, I don't know what you call it, the anime trap. Was, was it? it? Yeah, to was like it it's anime trap. You know? It was anime trap. Well, I mean, like Whoa. I can't. You know what I'm talking Yo, about? Yeah, I know. I no, I mean, like, like he he got the waifus who's in the traps all up in the uh, yeah, in the um, in the in as like it's as the, image. The pictures, yeah. But like, it's good music. Or was it vaporwave? If I recall last. Yeah, he did like vaporwave and like the lo-fi future stuff. Funk. But now, yeah, and future funk. But he's going more towards like the future bass kind of sound. You know, the EDM sound. He's kind of on like a similar wave as me. You know, we're mm-hmm. going for those like. The EDC kind of like escape, you know, kind of vibes, like the mm-hmm. big high production, like rave kind of sounds. Nice, it, it's you know. a it's a nice sound. I mean, you mm-hmm. get hyped. Yeah, and it, the thing is, with that kind of music, it sounds better the louder and bigger the speakers are. That's... We're trying to like take our sound and develop it so that we can start playing bigger and bigger mm-hmm. like audiences. Because I love, you know, I love the underground like rap stuff, yeah. but underground rap stuff doesn't have giant laser beams and like right. cool 3d uh projection mapping you know what right. i mean like i love the the visual stuff that they do with those kind of places yeah. yeah and i i've been getting back into like 3d modeling and stuff doing like original visuals nice. for that kind of wow. stuff it's really it's really fun you know what i mean and it's like a really much more interesting live experience than just like you know if you have like the migos on stage it's just three dudes run they're just jumping around they're like migos yeah uh, i mean migos. it's a cool vibe but i mean i yeah. I, I totally agree that um you know, EDM music, it takes it to a next level, especially if you're live. Oh, yeah, the live experience is it's, like... It's, uh, yeah. I, I can't... I don't go to... I used to go to a lot of raves back mm-hmm. in the day. I can't listen to too much EDM either, because I'm triggered to fucking roll and do ecstasy and pop molly, so yeah. I can't... <laughs> no, I feel that. I feel like there's really, in America, there's a really strong connotation in relation to, like drugs yeah. usage and uh like electronic music or even yeah. just regular shows you know uh just i was at brownies and lemonade on saturday and they like there's like five people at the front who i was talking to that were like rolling you know on molly and stuff and admittedly i don't i try and like stay away from those kind of like drugs nowadays you know i'm trying to like better myself focus hey, really on like out. music you know shouts out shouts out bettering yourself hey, you know you can I do agree. it you know i've I'm, got a bunch of friends who've done it you know you could do it too if you're out there and you're just looking for that little push yeah <laughs> that's cool yeah you know i, I want to touch on that man because uh, i realized that too because uh you know like now that i'm done with school mm-hmm. i can like all right i can focus on music and like the podcasting mm-hmm. and i realize when i party it's fun and all but I feel less productive. You don't have anything to show for it afterwards. And if you don't have anything to show for it, then you don't, you're not always going to remember what you did with your time. And I'd rather have a physical, like, memory. You know, it's yeah. like, I know I did this. Like, this song came out when this was happening. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, like, these bands, like, that I got, like, I only got these within, like, the last two weeks, but, like, each of them have, like, specific memories. Mm-hmm. I don't know why I'm, like, wearing them. No, that's but, cool. Uh, that's cool. I actually, I haven't been able to, I don't know how to get this off. Uh-huh. So it's just been on my wrist since Escape last week. But oh, you like, went to escape. How yeah, was it? It was, man, it was absolutely amazing. I was spending a lot of the time in the back studying, like, the uh, the, like the visual uh, people, that do, the ones who were doing, like, the projection mapping, which they use a, a program called Resolum Avenue 4. And it's really, like, DJing, but with visuals instead of audio. And the same way that you could take effects when you're DJing, you could use them on visuals. It's really an intuitive system, uh-huh. and you just blend the layers together. Wow. That's how you do the, the visuals for live performances. And then lasers, my uh, my friend Dash does lasers for uh, like huge 
like EDM kind of events, you know, they've like worked with Insomniac. It's just like, mm -hmm. you know, like it's just like MIDI triggers, just like it is with production, but instead of audio, it's just like visual. Yeah, games. I mean, talk to us mm -hmm. about, I didn't have no idea about the visual mm -hmm. aspect of it. Talk to uh, talk through us about, talk through us with that, like, mm -hmm. what is that? I mean, I know that like it's, it's becoming more and more of a bigger component. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you have to kind of like know what the DJ's playing so you can sync your visuals to the music? Well, in all honesty, you don't have to have, you could be a visual person who's doing stuff for like, you know, an Insomniac event or a like a hard event or whatever, you know, uh, wherever you're getting booked at. And you could be doing visuals and not know what they're doing on there. But with the program, you could tempo sync your visuals so that if you have say like a five second loop, that loop will loop in time with whatever BPM you have set in the program. So you could tap, if it's like, if they do a BPM transition, you could tap it in and the visuals will like sync with it. And you could always, uh, there's a button that you could restart like the loop cycle. So if it gets like slightly off, you could reset it and it'll go back to it. But really a lot of the time, the visuals don't have to be exactly in sync on their individual loops because when you have multiple layers going on by controlling like controlling the faders over it you can kind of like blend mm -hmm. like a background a mid ground on like a foreground layer so that you could like slam the foreground layer to the front when like a drop hits and it's like oh my god suddenly there's this imagery overlaid and so mm -hmm. people are like whoa they must have had that sync but really it's a dude in the back with just some faders and he's just like listening to music trying to like catch it and he's just like oh no here comes the drop boom and then he just slaps it in right with all the lights flashing and everything going mm -hmm. on um is there ever like a worry that someone who has um what's that again like um oh that someone might have a, a seizure a seizure yeah there's definitely with stuff like that there's they definitely warn people if you're prone to seizures i would not suggest going to one of these major festivals because a lot of the time even besides just the visuals and the lasers uh they have like these huge strobe lightings which will it just flashes so fast, just white on off. It's not something that would be very good for people who are prone to seizures, yeah. in my opinion. Mm -hmm. But for you know, just uh, regular, average, everyday, you know, people, it's. I think it's awesome. You know what I mean? Personally, I don't like. You know, I try not to associate. You know the huge experience with like drug usage. Although a lot of people, that's what they like go to because yeah. they're like, oh, you know, if it's such a huge big like high budget thing it's like oh that would be so great to you know do drugs right. at. but it's really cool to experience it without drugs by yeah. the way you know you still have just as good of a time and you know let me tell you i definitely do you know i've had a great time at all of these like big events that i've gone to even without like doing you know mm. molly or anything like right, that. right right yeah it's interesting man um the seizures thing like i always wonder because i don't think i'm prone mm -hmm. to it knock on wood it's just yeah. uh i just don't like seeing them i don't never know if i mm -hmm. i think it was it was Kanye's video, All of the Lights, that tripped me the fuck out. All of the Lights is, that, Hype Williams, by the way, he did that video, shout out Hype Williams. He's awesome. That's, his stuff's great, yeah. but, um, yeah, there is, it's such, uh, high like fast moving changes with like the visuals in that i feel like the all of the lights music video was definitely something that would cause seizures they had a like, warning too right yeah because that that video i remember that that was a beautiful video but it it'll mess you up if yeah. you're prone to those and it's like i don't want to find out if it's seizure so i'm just not gonna look at it mm -hmm. um i remember the first time i heard about seizures and like lights was porygon mm -hmm. from pokemon do you remember yeah. that um they had to changed the color of Porygon when he came to when the Pokemon series went to America because mm -hmm. a lot of the kids in Japan the original color he's like what purple and red yeah those combinations set off seizures for certain kids wow yeah that's crazy yeah yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, wow. Well, this is a long time ago. This was like a 98. Yeah. Well, about, like the original, like, Pokemon Yeah, original game. Pokemon. So, like, like the second generation, I want to say. First. Por Porygon was in the first generation? Yeah. I mean, I never I never really saw him much in, like, the cartoons. Yeah. In all honesty, I feel like the Pokemon cartoon wasn't as good as the Digimon cartoon, mm -hmm. but the Pokemon games were better than the Digimon games, so it was, like, a weird trade-off. I will say that... I mean, I don't know why I like the Pokemon so much. I mean, it was no, a great. I mean, it was the, great. The, it, it was great. great. No, don't get me wrong. I, get you. I love Pokemon. Me too. But um, no, the Digimon. The, there the was story more plot, was more cohesive. There was a development. Yeah, yeah, the whole series was like, it, it all came together. And Digimon touched on issues like you know, um, you know, single parents. You know, mm. like dead relatives. It really touched on things that like kids didn't know how to cope with. Ooh, that, but like really? seeing it in like portrayed like you know in the Digimon series, it was like a really. It, it was, like, a simpler way for, like, kids to, like, grasp those kind of, like, 
heavy things yeah. whereas in like Pokemon each episode was just start from new you know yeah. what I mean like reset the game kind of thing mm-hmm. agreed wow that was that's pretty cool yeah it's, it's, it's more but sometimes in the Digimon series as you follow the new Digimon uh, which I've uh, watched apparently there's like new seasons out um, I've watched all the way up through uh, the third season, hands down. That was my favorite, by the way, with, like, Terrormon and all mm-hmm. them. But uh, there, I knew there was one. I think I've watched through the fifth or sixth season. So if there's, like, a seventh one, I don't think I've watched it. The fourth mm-hmm. season was awful. Just got to throw that out there. Right. I don't know what they were doing with Digimon with the fourth season. Like, they were like, we'll just become the Digimon. And then it was, what? like, a whole. If you didn't watch it, don't. You don't want to know what to. I'm talking about. Yeah, Trust, yeah. yeah. Crazy man. Mm-hmm. All right. So, who were your early inspirations in music? Like, who did you look up to when you heard this person or artist? Oh, in music, honestly. Uh, originally, you know, what I started getting into as like a young kid when I had like the internet and stuff like that, because I was like a huge nerd as a kid, like gamer kind of kid. I was into like stuff like uh, DJ Surreal, you know, like kind of like that Tiesto kind of like old Tiesto. like rave kind of music. But when it came down to, like, artists, you know, as I started getting into more, like, rap kind of stuff, I was into, like, Pusha T, you know, yeah. like, Kanye West, the whole yeah. good music camp. Mm-hmm. Uh, I actually met a producer, uh, like, a week or two ago at the Music uh, Industry Insights meeting uh, for MIS students. He he worked with, like, good music. He had worked with, like, Rockefeller. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was, like, super out there. Like, I had never heard of him before. What's but yeah, he'd, I don't even know. That's the thing is uh-huh. I, had, I had never heard of him. He was, like... He was like a total like background dude, you know what I mean? Really? He wasn't like Kanye West producer where he was like, I'm Kanye West and like yeah. became like the whole rap persona thing. Like he was like actually like in the studio, like producing right. beats for like Pusha T and what? like, you know, clips, you know, I still have the old school oh. uh clips album. What is that? Till Lord the casket hath- drops? Till the casket yeah. drops is yeah. good. I like um, Hell hath no, yeah, yeah, Hell Hath No Fury. Oh yeah, dude. And uh, Lord Willing, but my mm-hmm. favorite were the mixtapes. We got it for cheap, mm-hmm. volume one to like Three or four. Yeah, I I think I only listened to like uh, three or I, I think I only listened to like three. I haven't listened to all of yeah, them. Yeah, they're a little older. A little like, older. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was like the days when you know mixtapes. You just jack people's instrumentals. Yeah, that's the and thing. You sold like, that shit. Yeah, I remember when Lil Wayne was doing that. You just jack Drought. instrumentals and people would cop it, and it was totally cool. And now if you try, you can't sell that. I mean, yeah. you could throw it on SoundCloud, but you'll still probably get hit with like copyright infringement. Um. From my experience, there's some songs I heard. I heard you can't yeah. do pound cake. Pound cake. That if it? like that that song with I think Nicki Minaj or Jay Z. Oh yeah, yeah. I heard I people had issues mm-hmm. um, with the instrumental uploading a song, the, the remix to pound mm-hmm. cake, doing pound cake freestyle, and get taken yeah. down. So far, I didn't have any issues yet. Like I even like did a. No, I have well not mm-hmm. yet, but I think super popular ones maybe you mm-hmm. can't or you you gotta like say off the top like this is not my music or whatever see I was doing the same thing but with uh, like EDM remixes when I started doing like when I started switching from my hip hop production Mm -hmm. more into like the hustle brand like the trap production like the Jersey Club kind of stuff I remember it it was totally chill when SoundCloud was like 2012 2013 I made remixes of like Ariana Grande The Weeknd Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Neighborhood you know Uh, shout out Jesse Rutherford you know uh yeah, I was doing remixes of those guys, and it was totally chill. But, like, uh, recently, you know, I did a remix of Belly and Future, Frozen Water, and, you know, my old remixes, they weren't that great, but, like, they didn't get taken down because it wasn't, like, an issue, and I never had, like, copyright infringement. But immediately with that Belly and Future remix, because it just, as soon as I uploaded it, they took it down, even though there was so much I had done to it. Like, I had completely gutted the middle of the mm-hmm. song, like, Unless you, like, knew that it was that song, you wouldn't have been able to, like, tell as much. But, like, they just, the system automatically picked it up and wouldn't even let me fully upload it. So that one's in, like, you know, that's in the vault. You know, real fans are going to get it maybe someday in a Dropbox, but, like, you'll never be able to find it online. Um, Well, okay, with EDM, I noticed a lot of remixing. I mean, Mm -hmm. you take out out vocals, chop vocals out the Mm -hmm. beats. Um, has the EDM community faced this like sort of like copyright infringement or has it like hindered their progress in making this stuff? I mean, in all honesty, you know, as an EDM artist, I feel like there's been like a shift the last few years where it's like if you're an electronic music producer and you don't also produce originals, like the kind of electronic scene, like the real, like the people who are doing this like consistently and like are going out and getting booked, they'll like look down on you a little bit, but really 
it used to be chill, you know, like a, everyone was doing like yeah, remixes. Yeah. You know, R.O. Grime and Salva, they went number one on SoundCloud in 2012 with their remix of Mercy by uh, Kanye West. Mm-hmm. And But now, like, Salva won't even put on his music on like SoundCloud or anything anymore because he, you know, he went number one. He didn't see a dollar from SoundCloud because it was just a hosting site. And so no one's making any money from it. Uh, but yeah, I feel like definitely it's kind of like the scene. A lot, most of the producers in the scene have kind of like regressed away from like uh, doing like remixes of popular songs. But you still have artists like Y2K, who is like really big, who's doing remixes of like ASAP Rocky, you know, mm-hmm. uh, Lord Pretty Flocko. And those are still getting like people are still getting hundreds of millions of plays on like EDM remixes of songs. Right. It's not like died down. And definitely, if anything, it's like only growing bigger. But like people who have been doing it for a while have started like moving away from just like the remixes. Yeah. Um, I agree, cause me now like, mm-hmm. with you, I'm trying to like purchase beats now, cause yeah. you know it's cool to like, I think anyone, almost anyone can just jack a beat from YouTube, mm-hmm. which is nothing wrong with it. Yeah, no, it's good. You it's know, good. it's, it's like, good. You could start off, starting yeah. off with, but you eventually want to have your own original content. Yeah, you, cause you can't put a remix on Spotify unless you get it licensed by the original label. Oh, really? You know what I mean? Yeah, no, you can get, you can do official remixes. Um, definitely, like you know, official remixes are still sick. Uh, but. You can't just be like Jack and stuff anymore yeah. and put it out. Like, if you tried to put on like a remix of, you know, ASAP Rocky or like Fro or whatever up onto Spotify, they would just be like, no, nope, immediately just be like, this, it's owned by this record label or and this is the publisher. You know, you'll have to talk to both of them mm-hmm. and get licensed to the um, wow. actual, like the song, which is like the sheet music with the yeah. publishing. And then you have to get access to or permission for the master recording from the record label. Damn. Yeah. You gotta uh, jump through hoops. Yeah, you were saying earlier how you said SoundCloud isn't what it was. You said like people are looking onto the next platform. What are the next platforms? Do you think? I mean, in all honesty, a lot of producers. This is like what I was saying with the whole like remixing thing. Uh, a lot of producers have been like moving away from remixes to make original content, because original content can be streamed on services like Spotify, mm. Title, Apple Music, and that's where a lot of music consumers are moving. You know, music consumers were never really the huge audience on SoundCloud. SoundCloud was more like the musicians or the people who were looking for the more underground music, but most right. average music listeners and consumers are looking for easily streamable content, which you could find on Spotify. You know, if right. you get a $5 Spotify subscription, you've got access to basically everything you could possibly want as an average music listener. And yeah, mm-hmm. you could just stream it all versus, you know, on SoundCloud, you gotta like look real hard for things and there's a lot of stuff that's not on there and then you know it's like it's just a huge hassle you know what I mean because people you see is YouTube mostly for their music for common listeners you know that's where you'd find all your like stuff that you listen to but no one's trying to stream a YouTube video while they're like driving around that's true it's a lot of data I I mean I do because I don't have Spotify and stuff like that Yeah. but you know I'm lazy you know bro bro college boy but uh you know it's just uh, so much easier for the average music consumer to get something like Spotify or Tidal. And then, luckily, you know, with that little bit of money, it's being broken down into royalties for the artists that are being streamed. So it's a better all-around, like, uh, program, or I guess not program, but, like, app or, like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, it's a better business model, basically, right, right. than it was with, you know, like, SoundCloud and stuff like that. SoundCloud is still having issues, you know, monetizing. Yeah. Because they're putting ads and stuff in, but they're, like, way, way, like, in debt. You know what I mean? The only reason that they're still afloat is because so many angel investors have given them money to, like, stay stay doing what they do versus, you know, Tidal and, like, Spotify and places like that. You know, they're getting paid to do what they do. They're, like, successfully monetizing right. their platform. Yeah, because I remember there was that big scare in the summertime mm-hmm. that uh, SoundCloud had 50-something days or something. Yeah. And apparently, I'm not even sure if it's really true, like, mm-hmm. Chance made a comment saying SoundCloud's not going anywhere. And yeah. I don't know, like, what his involvement I mean, was. <laughs> that was, like, kind of a publicity stunt with okay. Chance there. I mean, like, admittedly, I'm sure, yeah, he, like, 
he probably like gave them a donation or something. But like, I don't think it's Chance the Rapper single handedly yeah. like saved SoundCloud. You know, yeah. There's so many artists who got their start using SoundCloud, oh, and yeah. they owe their success to it. That there's no way that it would just like go away. You know, you look at artists like Black Bear. You look at artists like Y2K or like Ecali, which or are Yachty. Two of, yeah, l- yeah, Yachty. I mean, all, all these you know, SoundCloud rappers. I mean, Vert, you know? SoundCloud like that's the adjective. That's like the prefix to like their their rap. Like that's yeah, how you SoundCloud found out from rap. them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah I mean, there's so rappers. many of them, like Puya, Suicide mm-hmm. Boys, Fat Nick, all these dudes. You know, yeah. so I hope it doesn't go away because it's a pretty cool platform. You know? Yeah, it really is a good place to get like started, but I feel like it's just like it's not like the scene's dying or anything. It's not like people aren't using it. I just feel like it's not at the forefront of pushing like new music forward like it used to be like oh like soundcloud was where it was at to yeah. find new music but it's so like watered down with these repost chains and just everybody like throwing up all this it's like it's, it's too hard to sift through now unless you know like specifically like you follow artists on other social media right. platforms and link to their soundcloud you know i don't know like besides other musicians or like people like you know like akeen I don't know people who are like digging through SoundCloud to find like new music. You know, they're going to your pigeons and planes. They're going to your hype beasts. You know, the, or uh, hype tracks. You know, mm-hmm. they're going to the bigger like blogs, and that's where they're getting like their music from. And SoundCloud is just like the facet that's like being posted on not yeah. where they're finding the music anymore. I mean, there's so much, and um, you know, everyone can rap these days. Or anyone can do yeah. music these days. I guess what. I think Spotify and Tidal and Pandora now are like almost like gatekeepers. You mm-hmm. have to have some sort of like credibility. You have to meet certain requirements yeah. to have a SoundCloud account or Spotify. Mm-hmm. Or I'm sorry, not SoundCloud, but yeah, Spotify. Yeah, Spotify or Tidal. Or, yeah, mm-hmm. right, right. I mean, there's SoundCloud Pro, but I don't know who pays for SoundCloud. Not too I many. know someone who had SoundCloud Pro, which was cool because you could save the songs for right. offline uh, streaming. But for the most part, you know, with with places like uh, Spotify or Tidal, you have to have publishing uh, and like a distribution network to get through there. So you have to have at least at the very minimum, if you don't have a label or like a publisher, you have to have like CD Baby or TuneCore, Mm -hmm. which uh, admittedly is not a lot, but having to jump through a couple hoops to get your music onto one of the more major like platforms does weed out, you know, like the lower, like... As you said, anybody could do music nowadays, but not just anybody can get their music up on to like a major right. platform at the click of a button like you can with SoundCloud. Right. So it cuts out, it trims off a little bit of like the excess people who are just getting started who are using like really like, you know, poor quality mics or, you know, it's not a great mix down. Like people who are putting their music for distribution on major platforms, I feel are taking a certain level of like care and right. like there's a certain quality threshold that they pass, you know, to like put their music out versus with like, you know, like SoundCloud. Admittedly, if you look at someone like Made in Tokyo, uh, Uber Everywhere was just a freestyle he did in the kitchen. He threw it up on SoundCloud and, you know, it popped off, which is like great for him. But if you listen to the original recording, it's really low quality. Mm -hmm. It's like not very good. But I mean, the song was great. So I feel like SoundCloud is a great platform for finding the next like wave of artists like the new generation of artists mm-hmm. but for having like consistent quality content that fans can consume it's all about title you know your spotify's your apple music's you know if you have a if you're um I, if you're a college student mm-hmm. apple music is 4.99 a month yeah and isn't same with like spotify right and don't you get like hulu with spotify i don't know um i mean they still see me as a student nice. apple music I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. As, get, long as, as long as long yeah, as I keep get paid, going, like, I, I got paid $4.99, but it's great though, like to have it up there. Yeah. Um, okay. Do you, have you have any experience with TuneCore or CD Baby or anything? Yeah, my brother had um, our old. We used to do uh, after the rap group that we were working on, like Rogue Squadron, which my brother still does. He still raps heavily, although now he like produces too. But he's still pushing like the whole like rap wave. That's what he's been on, you know, mm-hmm. like good on him. You know, he's still like, he's only gotten more and more looking like an action figure and his raps have only gotten better and better. You know, shout out Trey Magnificent, my brother. Mm-hmm. Peep that new, uh, peep that new song that we're putting out soon. Uh, what is it? Like, yeah. We got, you know, like the song Amelie by Lil Wayne? Yeah. Amelie, Amelie. Well, we did this uh, rap, trap hybrid song where it's got like hip hop the first half and then it's got like a trap hop, like drop, you know, like the hustle brand kind of sound. Mm-hmm. And it goes like, 
it's got all the rap and stuff and then he goes like milli 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 rocking in Los Angeles and then I do like chops on like the uh Ooh. the milli bit so it's like milli 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 it's uh, it's That's fire clean. I can't like explain yeah, it with yeah. math but like yeah, you know, after after we were doing that, the whole Rogue Squad thing, uh, we had a record label called Once Again, which is where we were putting out, like, forward-thinking, like, SoundCloud producers kind of musics. Uh, so, like, my boy Attic Beats, you know, Bucket, you know, shout-outs to Hill Figure. You know, he used to be called Young Hill Figure, but now he's just Hill Figure. Wait, Tommy Hill Figure's son? No. Oh. No. Tommy but named Hill. after okay. the brand. Okay. I don't know how he doesn't have copyright issues with well, that. Gucci Mane doesn't, but yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, so I don't, you know, I, yeah, he's still he's still riding it, you know, mm-hmm. like, but yeah, you know, shout out to him. You know, we put out their music on our like little record label, but yeah, yeah we used we used TuneCore, and it was only like for like a, a label, you know, for like unlimited releases, it was like seventy bucks or something a year. So it's really not a huge investment cost, but if you want to have stuff streaming, if you want to actually be seeing like analytics for your plays if you want to be getting the data back on like actual consumers it's you know it's a really valuable asset mm-hmm. if you're trying like get it out there but if you're just doing good on soundcloud you know if you're like getting a bunch of plays on there and if you don't need if you're not trying to make that shift into like you know major consumer market then soundcloud's you know it's still a great tool you know it's an it's a valuable asset mm-hmm. or like uh yeah um, but you said you had a record label because when I think of record mm-hmm. label, I think of like a physical office mm-hmm. with a, like you know legitimate. Do you have do you have an office? No. Okay. So me and my brother, we ran it out of our house. You know what I mean? Right. Like we were doing all of like the PR work. You know, we were doing the A and R. We were doing like the promotion mm-hmm. all out of our house. You know, okay. so it was our two rooms, and then we had like a little guest bedroom. We did. I mean, we didn't like sign deals with anyone. It was basically we were just doing exclusive releases you know that's how like producers do it a lot of nowadays uh because most producers they don't sign a duo away with uh like a record label or anything because then they kind of put pigeonholes them into a corner they can't really get out of it whereas a lot of modern day producers they're putting out one song through this label and one song through that label and they're doing something with this youtube promotional network you know huge like Places like trapmusic.net or like um, edm.com, those are still huge promotional avenues for like producers. So if you could do like one exclusive release through them, that would be great for your name and that would bring hype to your catalog, Mm -hmm. which you have through like other um, record labels because you're still going to be getting the same royalties off of, you know, if it's coming from this guy versus this guy. I mean, depending on what your like, you know, percentage is and how you set up your cuts, but for the most part, you know, we were just releasing singles, you know, these were just like our homies from the internet, you know, these were just dudes we were talking to on SoundCloud, we were like, hey, you know, like, if you want to put out a song with us, so, yeah, it was just like, we had a little compilation tape, you know, we put out a couple, like, uh, EPs, some singles, some remixes, but nothing, like, super crazy, you know, we weren't trying too hard to push the record label because that was more so just an extension of us, Mm -hmm. that's like what we were doing, that was like the subsidy underneath us. Versus, like, some people, I know, that's, like, what they do, like, the whole time. You know, that's, like, uh, you got your, like, Motowns where it was, like, physical records off it. And, like, you had people working in offices figuring out new promotional techniques to, like, push them. Whereas we were more, like, you know, it was more of, like, the new school generation kind of, like, we were, like, working with what we had, Mm -hmm. where we were, you know, like, we did what we could. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I might check at that. Yeah, TuneCore. TuneCore is if you're a solo artist, you know it's not a bad it's not a bad way uh, to get your music distributed. I, I've been hearing a lot of TuneCore. Mm-hmm. Like that's how you get iTunes, right? Yeah, admittedly, there's like people argue between CD Baby or TuneCore. Mm-hmm. I like TuneCore personally uh, versus CD Baby because you can get like uh, I'm pretty sure you can get like a full year like unlimited release thing with TuneCore, and I'm pretty sure CD Baby is a on release mm-hmm. payment kind of thing. Right. So if you're releasing a lot of stuff, you know, like for a record label like we were, uh, it's good to like, you know, get an account set up like that because then you just keep, you know, scheduling releases and putting them out. But yeah, no, uh, really they do similar things, you know. They're not really like keeping a lot of your like publishing money, but really publishing nowadays, it, it used to be with your publishers, they would be out pushing your catalog, trying to get you placements and get you money for it. Versus nowadays where you have your CD babies and your tune cores where they'll upload it and they'll have the rights to your publishing, but they won't be pushing it, you know what I mean? If you want to go get a TV placement with one of your songs, you're going to have to go do that yourself nowadays. Versus in the past where you're publishing, 
would be out like hustling that for you. You'd be waking the music and there would be a guy at your publishing firm who would be calling up people being like, hey, I've got the rights to blah, 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 if you want to put it in blah, blah, blah. Okay. For other people and myself included, what mm-hmm. is publishing? Publishing, okay. So when you think of musical rights, um, people normally think of the like the master, like the original, like the physical copy of the song, and that's owned by your record label. Versus the publishing, which is the written music, like the song itself is still like you could take any of the modern day songs that are produced and you could turn them into sheet music and you could sell that sheet music to like a school to perform in an orchestra and you would get royalties from the publishing for that versus getting uh, royalties on your master recording which is what the record label owns. And it used to be in the past that publishers and record labels were two separate entities but nowadays you know record labels are handling the publishing and stuff too or people are doing you know, they're owning their own masters and the publishing, and they're not even working with record labels or publishing companies, and they're doing it all on their own. So publishing companies back in the day, they would push your catalog to get placed in, you know, uh, let's say like a Sears commercial. They would sell, mm-hmm. if they sold just the publishing rights, but your record label didn't agree to sell the master recording, Sears could re-record your original oh, song right. with a new band and mm-hmm. use that recording in their commercial and they wouldn't have to pay for the original master recording but they'd still be paying for the publishing it's for the rights to the song but not for the physical song itself mm, wow thank yeah. you for cleaning that up am uh, i a student yep yeah <laughs> uh and what about what's up with ascap man ascap bmi you know those are just like your uh pro's uh, your performance royalty organizations those are really just the companies that are out there collecting on uh, royalties so if you're like a little Uzi Vert and if your song is getting played in like a sports bar or whatever uh, you know these companies that are like uh, besides restaurants restaurants don't have to pay for to play music but if you're going to like a nightclub nightclubs have to pay a yearly fee to performance royalty organizations like ASCAP or BMI because they're streaming music. That's like a huge source of their revenue. And so that's being broken down and then divvied up for artists who are either with uh, ASCAP or BMI. So they're just out there collecting money for your songs if they're getting streamed. But if you're, I mean, if you're not getting like played, you're not really gonna get like a lot of money back from like your ASCAPs or Mm -hmm. your BMIs. But if you're like, you know, Migos, you know, you're getting a huge check consistently Mm -hmm. from like, uh, you know, Bad and Bougie getting streamed in whatever ad or whatever, like, you know, like in the street fair Mm -hmm. in like New York or like whatever stuff like that. Um, Do you recommend like SoundCloud rappers or just up and coming artists to get, sorry, um, Uh, ASCAPs? uh, I would suggest waiting to sign uh, with a performance royalty organization until you're doing actual like if you're streaming if you're if you have distribution if you're like doing TuneCore and if you're uploading your music through there and if you're getting like you know at least like 10 or 20 bucks a month from that then yeah I would suggest you start you know getting your music uh, licensed with uh, or I would suggest signing with a performance royalty organization like mm-hmm. ASCAP or BMI uh, I think I'm with BMI uh, I don't remember. Um, I think that if you're more of a producer, you're BMI. Mm-hmm. If you're more than, if you're more of an artist, you're with ASCAP, correct? Yeah. Well, ASCAP and BMI, it's really just the it's it's so it's not a monopoly. Back in like the 30s or 40s, one was basically owned by like the radio, and that was like because the radio was trying to like make it cheaper for them to like license out songs and then the other one was like ran by like artists and like mm. you know musicians but essentially at this point they're they're basically the same you're gonna get like unless you're doing like hundred million dollar deals you're gonna be getting like basically the same check cut from either one and it's not really gonna be a huge mm. uh, issue which one you choose but in all the honesty I would suggest you know waiting normally to sign with something like that until you're actually getting like streaming mechanical royalties back from like your songs so if you're not getting like royalties back if you're just putting music out on SoundCloud you don't really need to sign with a performance royalty organization because you're not going to be getting royalties from the performance of your songs Mm -hmm. but once you start getting like you know, if you have like an, a break hit indie song that say like hit a million plays on SoundCloud, then yeah, I would say go sign up with a PRO, you know, go hit up ASCAP or BMI, figure out which one's gonna be better for your personal taste, you know, get distribution, you know, sign up with like a TuneCore or like mm-hmm. find a record label to release your music. But until you're hitting like larger milestones like that, I wouldn't 
you don't really need it. I mean, you always can, but there's no real reason to pay for something if you're not like gonna right. use it. You know what I mean? Like, right. why waste the fifty dollars to right. go sign up if you're not gonna get like fifty dollars back at True. least? All right, let's get let's move back to Hustle Brand. How did you get the name Hustle Brand? That's a Hustle, really cool name. <laughs> Hustle Brand, dude. That was honestly that was like mad jokes. Okay, so when <laughs> I was originally making music as Mast M V S K D, which uh-huh. was like a like a hip hop producer, like that's what I was doing, and then. It was actually, it was even worse progressions of that same name before that, but I'm not going to touch that's on cool, that. That's cool, that's cool, I feel no, no one needs to hear about how the even worse names that came before. I feel you. Yeah. But basically, me and my friend J.D. Del Carmen were like brainstorming names one day, and I don't know exactly how it came about, but as like a joke, like, because we just, I mean, like, uh, that one movie with like Russell Brand who came out like recently back in like 2011 or 2012 mm-hmm. or whatever with like... I think Jonah Hill is in it. Get him to Greek. Yeah. I or think. was it? Or is it a saving? No, something about Sarah. Or yeah, like, the one where they were like in Hawaii or whatever. Oh, like, I think it was. Uh, was it Sa- not saving Sarah Silverman? But yeah, no, something I, Sarah. Know, yeah, 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 yeah. And then they're like in Hawaii or whatever. And like, so basically, like, I don't know exactly how we came about it, but it was kind of like a oh ha ha instead of Russell Brand. What about like Hustle Brand? And it was so it was like because we were dasi- we were taking names and we were switching like letters and oh, stuff yeah. around because that's how we got to Mast. Because all right, I wasn't gonna say, it, but originally it was Mast Musket and it was uh-huh. really bad. It was M V S K D M V S K T. Oh, okay. And so it was really like it was terrible. It right. Was, but like. So that name degraded back in like Mast, and then like later on we were like, oh, you know, what about like hustle brand and so it was like oh haha like as a joke at first Mm -hmm. and it wasn't going to be anything serious but i I put out a remix of oh god what was that first one it was i don't think it was my neighborhood remix was like the first one but i I basically just put out like a bootleg on that uh hustle brand account and it hit like a thousand or like 1500 plays in like a couple days and i was like oh okay this is cool i was like oh people are actually checking this out which I wasn't expecting because we were just like, oh, yeah, jokes, like, ha, hustle mm-hmm. brand. That sounds like a trap guy, you know? And then, you know, shortly thereafter, I put out my uh, remix of Drake's song with I Love McConan Tuesday, mm-hmm. and that had, like, 3,000 or 4,000, like, plays, and we are like, oh, okay, this is, like, people kind of like this. We're like, all right, you know, like, maybe we'll keep doing it. And then shortly after that, I put out my Ariana Grande and the mm-hmm. Neighborhood remix, and both of those, like, you know, like, the Ariana Grande remix on all streaming platforms probably hit like over a hundred thousand plays because it was on a couple different. It wasn't just on my page; it was on like a, one of my homies' record labels pages, and it was on some YouTube channels. So on my page, it only hit like twenty or thirty thousand, but like when you add them all together, it hit like a hundred k. And then like with the Neighborhood remix, I hit like I want to say two hundred or so thousand on just my account. I don't even know where else it was uploaded, but like that's when it was like, whoa, you know, people like. This was just Matt. This was just jokes. This was just we were just laughing, you know. Yeah. It was like, it was like human, you know. It was like it was like the whole like big man Shack, you know, road man Shack thing, you know. It was yeah. just it was just jokes, you know. We were just messing around, and then suddenly right. people were like, "No, yeah, hustle brand. That name's hard." And we we're like, "It's a very hard. It's a very clever name." Yeah, you know, say. people were like, people were like, "Yo, that that goes in." And I was like, "This is a this is a joke." Like you know, like and ever since I've had it, I mean, I've always. It sounds like a name that like I can't take very seriously, but like people take it That's like a cool totally name. seriously. So it's you're also English yeah. too, right? So hustle brand, you, you know. Yeah, you know, Russell I'm trying brand. to I'm trying to do something similar to Russell Brand, where I'm trying right. to use like you know like pop pop culture to you know like have create like a, a like an impact on the world, like make the world a better place. Mm. But after, of course, you know, having I have to get to a, a point, you know, where I can actually make a change. I can't right. just do nothing like. Well, at, at, you know, you got to get a little bit of clout before of you can influence, you know, people. Of course, man. You know, but if you look at Russell Brand, dude, he's making, like, huge waves. You know, he's doing his podcast and everything. He's, like, really trying to – he's really trying to make the world a better place, yeah, you is. know, and I really respect him for that, yeah. you know. Uh, let's see. We talked about when you started producing music. I mean, so can you talk to us again through, like, your – what kind of music you produce? You say you went from EDM to hip hop to back to EDM kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, like as a kid, because I never, I never would have imagined being like a record producer. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That's not like in my wildest dreams as a kid. I would never have thought of that. Like maybe as a kid, I thought I'm gonna be a rock star for five minutes. But right. I, even then, I didn't really try and pursue that. But basically, 
I started off um, doing just like hip hop production for like my brother and like sometimes for like friends, just like making beats and stuff. And oh, my bad. Um, cool. I was using FL Studio at the beginning, and then as I sort of like progressed. I saw like my friends were like transitioning over to, like Ableton, like the more serious producers, the ones who were like doing more than just like flipping, you know, like random guitar samples off of the internet. Mm -hmm. Like we're starting to use Ableton, and so I transferred over to it, and I had like made a couple like trap EDM songs, kind of like an FO Studio, but nothing very good. Like back then, I was more so doing like I was listening to like really like hip hop kind of stuff, you know, like ASAP Rocky. Like I was really into like you know, Earl Sweatshirt, mm -hmm. like Jack Mushroom kind of stuff, you right. know. While I'm on the subject, by the way, uh, working with my boy Schoolie 300, got hey. a song coming out soon, that's gonna be fire, can't like wait, can't, don't have a release date yet, but just, you know, stay tuned. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, back then those were the kind of guys I was listening to, and so I was like doing that rap kind of stuff. But then it was like, well, like that trap kind of sound was emerging in like 2012 and 2013. So there was artists like OK with like two O's, and I was listening to his stuff. And he did like FO Studio kind of trap beats. And so I was like, I tried to make a couple beats like that in FO, but they always like, you know, fell flat from expectations. You know, they weren't that great. Mm -hmm. But as I kind of shifted into working in Ableton, I kind of got toward, I'm moving towards like a more progressive West Coast experimental like beat kind of sound, mm -hmm. like kind of what Low End Theory was starting to influence. Right. Because they were really the beginning of like experimental like beat scene in, uh, they were like the beginning of the experimental beat scene in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. but their stuff is more like boom bap kind of still influenced. Right. Whereas like the new, I feel like the new producer generation is moving more towards the like heavier sound design, the huge you know eight oh eight kind of sound, that heavy hitting beats. That if you break it down, you can still rap over those. My brother slays those kind of trap beats you know with like the new school edm production but at the heart of it there's still just fat beats you know if you mm. look at troy boy troy boy was influenced by west coast beats you know he loves that old school stuff and you can like hear it in his sound because even though there's those electronic elements to it and like the synthesized kind of tones there's still those banging hip-hop beats underneath it it's just how it kind of all molds and like meshes together that really is like oh. that new sound right yeah I mean there's definitely a big change in how like hip hop sounds mm -hmm. I gotta check that out later on um, mm -hmm. so can you talk us talk us through your music process like how do you come up with like say I don't know remix or like beats mm -hmm. Cause, um, I mean I tried doing the whole beat thing when uh, mm -hmm. Kanye West came out he was a rapper and yeah. like he makes beats I tried I downloaded the Fruit, fruit, fruit loops. loops yeah I had no idea how to use it I gave up like I don't know how to do it so how do you do it man honestly dude I did the same thing with fruit loops two times before I actually got into actually like making beats because I downloaded in like fifth grade and I tried to make a beat and then you know I just stopped and then I tried to get in seventh grade and it stopped and then when I picked it up in like ninth grade tenth grade I just like kept going mm -hmm. but really with remixes it's a lot easier to get the creative flow going because you just throw it up into your digital audio workstation you figure out whatever key the song is and then you just go you just start adding stuff on from there but you already have a song so you can really like take ideas from that like if you just listen through it you're like oh yeah i could add this onto it it's a really good way to get the creative juices flowing and a really good way to learn about music theory and about music is by just remixing a song because you have to break down the song a little bit while you're working on it and it helps like you can see what the other producer was kind of like thinking mm -hmm. when they were working on it but when it comes down to original song dude some producers I know are so like concise and like clear with like what they do and how they do it to set up their songs and I am nothing like that at all I just go in there and I'm just like start working on sounds I'm like oh this is, sounds kind of cool or like this is a cool like drum kind of element mm -hmm. you know every song I start off differently you know I'll start off on the chorus sometimes or I'll start off on the intro but I just keep going I just keep building onto the song and keep adding elements and then really like I feel like a song doesn't start to develop and still until you start getting like 20 or like 30 channels deep and then once you really start getting like a kind of like visual like lay for the song you can be like oh okay and then listen through it and you can be like okay well maybe I should add you know this over here or maybe I should ease back on like something like this over here but really when it comes to creating for me I don't have like a concise idea for a song most of the time most of the time I just go in and I just start working on things I admittedly sometimes I'll like 
you know, be like playing piano or whatever, and I'll be like, this is a good idea for a song, and I'll like try and write down the chords or remember the chords and work on it later and take that idea and build off it. But most of the time, it's just like, let's make a beat, right. and then I'll just throw some stuff together. I'll be like, that sounds kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Maybe we could throw this on, and then if it doesn't sound cool, I'm like, maybe not, and I'll take it out. And then you know, it's just like kind of like it's like a puzzle, mm-hmm. except none of the pieces actually fit together. But you gotta like try and kind of make a collage, and like if it comes out cool, then like yeah, and if it doesn't, you kind of like slide right. it to the side, and you don't like show that one. Yeah, I can imagine like sometimes like making a beat takes like an instant or sometimes it takes hours or days oh yeah dude because i've made like fire beats in like five minutes that people like are like yo like this is sick versus like some songs i've spent like days on and i'm just like this is garbage and i'll just Mm -hmm. like throw it in the trash right um so what about you man um you have an album on the way yeah, the work. Okay, so I've had this album on the way for a long time now. Mm-hmm. Cause when I started going to CSUN, uh, before I was going to CSUN, I was like hella pushing my music. You know, I was really trying to like, get out there. I was like really doing my thing. You know, I was getting like a bunch of plays. You know, my remixes were out there. I had a few originals that were popping. Mm-hmm. And then when I started going to CSUN, I was like, I eased back on that because I realized how much I didn't know when I started going here. And so I was like, oh, you know, I shouldn't just be putting out low quality music. I shouldn't be like trying to hype up all this stuff. I should try and figure out where I'm going with this more so. Mm-hmm. Don't do that. Don't do that. That was the worst mistake, really? dude. Yeah, no, it's because if I just kept pushing out and doing music, I wouldn't have, it wouldn't have been bad. It wouldn't have been like negative, you know what I mean? There couldn't have been any like hurt, but like not putting out anything and not pushing your sound and not like, you know, you're not going to get anything if you don't try. Like, if you're not actively trying to get it, no one's going to come up and hand it to you. So in that time period that I've, these last two years where I haven't really been putting out a lot of music, there's, like, not a lot to show for it on, like, my, like, stats because there's not a lot of, there's nothing to play, so how would you be getting plays? But, so, I've been really just, like, trying to take my best songs that I've been working on over these last, like, two or three years, and I've been trying to just, like, finish them, get, like, the right vocalist on them and just I'm really trying to like push that out soon I don't have a set date like Akeem does Mm. he honestly he's not even done with his album yet he just set a date so that he has to get it done by then right you know which is a good idea you know set deadlines because something you want to get done without a deadline is just a dream you know what I mean but once you set deadlines that's a goal you know That's a boss move right there. You know, Damn. set goals. Don't just dream. You know, got to get those deadlines going. But uh, yeah, no, it's the work, the progress, like the work in title is the Muses EP. Mm-hmm. That's what it's been for like a long time. I've had the artwork done for a while. Um, although it may change from the Muses EP to something like you know something else like still trapping or like Ooh. you know I thought that was hard because you that's know I'm st- hard. still making trap music I'm not still trapping though I don't trap anymore but like whoa, I still make whoa. trap beats you know allegedly like, allegedly allegedly you know no yeah. I, I'm not I'm really open about like the stuff I've done in the past because I, I want to like I try and use like the stuff I've done as like to help motivate people to not you know you don't have to like trap you know like yeah, you know admittedly it's kind of it's really a shame that we live in a world where you can make more money like trapping than you know working at an honest living yeah, but, but, but you can really do there's a lot you can do like the, you know, yeah I mean like the inverse of that is you know you can get locked up for a long time oh yeah it's not worth it's, it it's, it's no, a no, high no. risk high reward situation you know I don't condone it or condemn it mm-hmm. It's you know you do what you want to do what you no, gotta I do. Condemn it. No, don't do that. No, I mean you know not, like you know do move. you know like if you have to like there's certain situations when you may have to do it, but you know don't like. It's not a lifestyle. It's like, not a lifestyle. It's a temporary no. thing. It's it's so over glor it's glorified and like glamorized in like pop culture and pop media, but it's like really not like lit. You know what I mean? Like Pusha T, you know, like Malice, they wouldn't have been trapping if they didn't have to. You know, they wouldn't have been like moving weight. Like that I, wasn't like. Uh, I, I heard, mm-hmm. uh, well, there are stories they weren't doing it. It was their manager that was doing it. Yeah, I mean, they it's, you know, like, they were, like, involved. And, yeah. like, before they started doing music, like, that's right. what they were like. And they say, like, their manager to, like, because they're obviously big enough. They're not trying to, like, incriminate anything. Right. They did, you know, because they were, they were, they were moving, I, like, weight of, I, like, really, like, heavy stuff. I wanted to, like, to, yeah, I mean, I want to, I mean, that's the thing with hip-hop music, you know. How do you know? what's real and what's not and and two like if it's not real does it matter because in a sense mm-hmm. it is entertainment but hip hop started as like a you know the message is real yeah how do you 
balance that like in 2017 you know yeah. i feel like people try too hard to be like real a lot of the time yeah. in, in like the rap community but like if you look at the like the kids who are like really doing like good stuff with like music nowadays they're not taking themselves too seriously you know they're just like doing whatever they're just hitting the studio mm-hmm. and they're like making whatever kind of music yeah. a lot of kids nowadays are really like moving away from I feel like younger generations are moving away from the whole like drug scene cause kids like they're smart you know nowadays they're like why would I get started doing stuff like that when I could just not you know what I mean I feel like are, mm-hmm. Like, with the internet and stuff nowadays, they can, like, like yeah, there's people, like, pushing, like, you know, Lil Pump, like, I spend more money on lean than on you do on rent, you know? But, like, hey, kids aren't really just, like, guy. trend. Yeah, yo, <laughs> yo, shout out Lil Pump, you know? Lil Pump. <laughs> Lil Pump. <laughs> Lil Pump. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel you, man. Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a flex. Yeah. And it's, like, you know, there's no reason to flex if you're not, like, you know, don't try and flex for no good reason. Like, you could just be, like, just chill, you know? Like, yeah. you ain't got to, like... It's so much... I, I just don't ever get, like, why people are trying to, like, f- flex it's, so hard, like, trapping and stuff. It's, it's entertainment. Like like, you know, it it, it, mm-hmm. it captures an audience. Mm-hmm. You know, it's... One can say, you know, it's like... Um, I mean, you don't... People don't take Stephen King seriously. They don't think he's a serial killer, but look at all the things he's written about. Yeah, you know what I mean? You like, know, if you look at like a Bobby Schmurda, like oh, that, that is not the move. Like, that don't was, be a Bobby Schmurda. Oh, that's that's, just, that's foolish. You know, you know like, I feel bad, man, because he was on the come up. Even Jay Z and Beyonce were doing a Schmurda dance. Yeah, and it's just unfortunate, man. He like he had something going, and now I don't know what it was. Was it what he said in the song? He said, "I've been selling cracks since like the fifth grade." No, I mean, I don't Bro, think it was like, that. I think it was something like oh no, something he, something he, caught he, a body about a week ago. He oh yeah yeah he incriminated himself. Also yeah, the whole gun thing. Like I don't get why like rappers love to glorify like guns and stuff because gun violence is like not cool. Oh yeah, I mean I, especially with these. In the, this day and age yeah two all the weeks shootings. ago there was a there was a uh, a rave in uh, England you know like an underground and three dudes with automatic rifles pulled up and like started shooting into, really? this, into an underground rave luckily someone there because it was an underground they had like they had their strap on them and they fired back and no one died there were two people who had to go to the hospital but no one died luckily but that's like not cool dude I mean yeah. raves are supposed to be like positive yeah. environments Why like that rave? people can be like yeah. you know that can people can really express themselves and I feel like that's just like not like it's so not cool dude. yeah like, to come yeah. up on like because these are people who are trying to escape the everyday like monotony and people who are trying to like have fun and like pull up on people like that with like semi-automatic rifles right. it's like that's not something that would be like no one would think to do that right. unless like we were in like a hyper like you know gun crazy you know weird like yeah, I, I mean I don't even know how to describe this. It's uh, no, like, it makes sense. I mean, like, like there was dis- a there was a Texas thing that happened over the weekend. Yeah, at a at a church. Yeah, it, it's, it's that's it's crazy, sickening, man. Like it, it's unfortunate. Like knock on wood, we're so numb to it. Oh, another one, you know, like another one. Okay, you know. Like, yeah, what, another one, happen? dude. And, and like with Vegas, dude. Just a few weeks ago, like that's insane. Like a country yeah. music festival. Like I'm not personally a fan of country music, but like. That still isn't a reason to, like... It's never a reason, yeah. There's n- no, yeah, man. I mean, that's why I've had this idea for... Uh, I've had this idea in the work for a little while. I've been trying to put together with a couple of my friends who do, like, raves and stuff mm-hmm. called Make Raves Safe Again, which is, uh, you know, like, an organization to, like, promote, like, safe drug usage. Like, yeah. um, admittedly, like, not to promote the usage of drugs right. but to, harm reduction yeah harm reduction so at like festivals having like testing kits places like that I know that uh, at some festivals or I think it might be in California but like you're not allowed to have testing kits at music festivals because then that's supposed to promote drug usage but I think that's totally backwards way of thinking because people it's like with teaching abstinence you know what I mean people are still going to do it and it would be better to give them the means to protect themselves versus letting them go do it on their own and then you know hurt themselves yeah yeah I I totally agree man I mean um, you know like you said uh, the music the music festivals and the EDM scene is like heavily 
like entrenched with drugs yeah in, intertwined almost and only you know, in america though in other really? countries yeah if you look in like east asian countries or if you look at like you know like south america um not as much like europe europe still like is kind of into the drug scene but not as like much as really it's in america you go to shows and like a bunch of people in the crowd are messed up but if you go to these other countries they're like just dead stone cold sober just in love mm. with the artist's music and they go there because they want to listen right. to it and support it and they're there they're there the whole time they're receptive they understand what's going on versus if you're just doing drugs and going to a show you're not gonna remember what you did you're not gonna like remember what they played what the artist was doing but when you're like they're sober you're con- you're completely in the moment you're immersed in the experience yeah. and you can remember what's going on yeah I mean well I feel like with mm-hmm. places like South America and Southeast Asia and Asia drug mm-hmm. law are a lot more strict there you oh know? yeah no I that's mean, definitely you know, like yeah mm-hmm. um and also too like with you know i never personally went to um to raves or edm for like the artists mm-hmm. i wanted to like there's some experience you have with, like you know taking ecstasy and just like it's just that feeling but mm-hmm. but i guess it depends if you're like really into the music then you're into the music but me admittedly i was never like oh i gotta listen to this to this artist in a set no i just want to fucking roll balls and like you know, yeah, be you know, part it's, of that vibe. It's because it, with the large like production setups, it's like obviously a more interesting environment right. to be in on those drugs right. than just being at a house or like you know going out and doing like whatever hood right. shenanigans. Yeah. like you know while you're on like you're like you know drinking lean or whatever, right. like popping pills, like whatever it is your drug of choice. You know, it's obviously going to be more interesting at like an event like that. But I feel like. That's just because of like the pre like that's just the connotation because of what's happened before. Mm-hmm. But if it was just on its own, you know, if that wasn't like related to it, I don't think it would be as heavily associated with yeah. shows, especially with like EDM, because I feel like people are like, oh, electronic music, like you know, that's like super associated with like Molly and E. Yeah, you know I mean, like definitely. other like rappers, like if you go to a rap show, you're not gonna see everyone on like E, but you're gonna see everyone's like smoking. You know, people are gonna be doing like coke in the back yeah. or whatever. People are gonna be like. You know, they're going to be doing their, like, drug of choice in association yeah. with that show. But, like, yeah, I don't know. It's yeah. just, like... I get you. I mean, like, we... It's true that you don't need to do all these drugs to have fun. I mean, it's an experience. Mm-hmm. But I think it's once you, like, associate, like, drugs with that experience and you have to do it, that's when it's, like, kind of, like... Mm-hmm. It's not as fun anymore, you know? No, yeah, like, there was a girl, when I was at Brownies and Lemonade this weekend, which is, like, one of my favorite shows, you know, trying to get, trying to get Akeen on the lineup over there, I was talking to the dude who runs it, you know, shout out B&L, they're pushing forward the new, like, SoundCloud producer generation, but when I was there, this girl was talking to me who was out of her mind, it's, like, rolling, you know what I mean, and I'm just, like, a, a, I just like talking to people, I just like meeting people, I like these kind of shows, you know, like, I like to, you know, go out and... Mm. I just like to dance, you know, I like to have a good time. Yeah. But she was like, oh, yeah, you know, she was talking about how she was rolling, and she's like, oh, do you ever just, like, feel like you're, like, dead and sad after, like, rolling? And I was like, I was like, no, because I don't really, like, do that anymore. And she was like, oh, I took Molly th- every day at Coachella, and I just wanted to, like, die for a week. Yeah, Because yeah. you don't have dopamine, you don't have serotonin in mm-hmm. your brain, and you're just your body isn't going to, like, know how to compensate with that. You're going to feel awful after yeah, doing all it, those it's, drugs. Yeah, it's tough. Yeah, I, yeah. The come down is, like, not worth it, in my opinion. Because you can go to these shows, and your body's going to naturally, you know, release your dopamine and serotonin. You know, to a point, though, it's not going to just dump it all, and then you'll still feel good afterwards, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? You'll have a good memory of the show yeah. versus, like, wanting to, like, die, like, afterwards. So. Yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's weird. Like, uh, you know, being someone who used to take a bunch of Ian Molly, mm-hmm. it, it's a weird cycle. You know it's going to be bad, but you feel like, oh, it'll be worth it, but then, like... Yeah. You know, when you're dying on, like, the second, third day because you have no sleep or, like, serotonin, mm-hmm. it, it, it's shitty. I, I think over time, like, sad to say, like, you, you, like, learn two ways. Either you learn because you're like, hey, this is bad, or unfortunately something may, bad may happen to you, like a bad come down or a bad trip, or you get arrested. Or you could have a bad pill, dude. I've seen, at oh. a, dude, at Escape, I saw a dude seizing on the ground probably because he took some bad drugs. You don't know what's going in those pills. Exactly. Like, I mean, like, there is sites out there. I'm not going to say sites. Yeah. They'll, no, like, I, help you, you out. Can, but you're definitely right. There's definitely bad pills going on. And, you know, a lot of these kids, they're not, their plan probably wasn't to take ecstasy. And they don't know how to handle it because mm-hmm. they always said, don't do it. But then last minute, their friend goes, hey. Just take it, fuck it, mm-hmm. and they take it. They don't know what to do. They don't know how much dr- water to drink. They don't know like mm-hmm. you. You can't be like you're t- 
temperature or rise up and be in a large crowd, a lot of people, you can like overdose or die. Yeah. They don't know that. And I think, like you said, it's really good to promote safe drug use, mm-hmm. harm reduction. It's going to happen. Might as well oh, yeah. find a way to like reduce the deaths and, mm-hmm. and like injuries. Yeah. And I know you're saying that you're not going to tell anybody any of the websites, but there are definitely websites out there that you can go and check for reports on your pills, whatever you're taking. <laughs> so you <can> Bars. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, I agree. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it definitely look, I mean, because it's better at least to know what you're going to be taking versus just like, oh, yeah, like someone just hands you something. You're like, dude, just take this test. Like, oh, you know, yeah. at least like a little bit of research can go a long yeah. way, you know, because you can't come back from permanent brain damage. Yeah, that's scary. Um, that's very scary. Yeah. Uh, let's see. On to lighter things. You also Sorry rap. About that, yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. It's good. I'm, no, it's good. I'm glad because you're the first guest mm-hmm. I've talked to. This, this, uh, has this much knowledge on music mm-hmm. and also an EDM scene or just that sound. So thank oh, yeah. you for I'm your. I'm super into that. That's like, awesome. I, all I want to do is like promote like safe raving. You know, mm-hmm. I really want to just go out and throw cool shows and yeah. just like really like help people like. Something I've always been, like, told is, like, you know, knowledge is meant to be shared, you know? Mm-hmm. There's a lot of producers who like to, like, try and, like, keep their secret sauce yeah. hiding behind the back, you know? But, like, I feel like that's really not the way to approach things. Like, if you're more knowledgeable than someone on a subject, then it's I feel like it's your job to help them become more educated. Right, right. Especially when we're in a college environment, it's supposed to be, like, an area of, like, higher learning yeah. versus just, like, you know, there's no reason to... Uh, hold back on like information and stuff like well you know people do hold back because they're scared that that person may um outdo them Mm -hmm. which is something that i i don't understand either is some a lot of people nowadays they like try and block off other people's shine because they're afraid that they're Mm -hmm. gonna shine dimmer whereas i feel like there's like there's a, there's a moment for everyone to shine, yeah. you know what I mean? If you spend your life putting on other people, there's going to be a moment where you're going to get put on, you know what I mean? But if you're constantly trying to, like, devalue other people because you're afraid that they're going to surpass you, then you're not going to get anywhere. Right, right. Like, this weekend when I was at b and I, uh, I had a fan, you know what I mean? I got it from these girls at Escape last week. Super nice girls. Shout out them, you know what I mean? But uh, when I was at b and I was, like, fanning myself off. And then behind me, there was, like, this girl who, uh, who she was, like, she, it, she was dancing a bunch, and she was, like, sweating, and she was, like, panting a little bit because she was, like, hot. And, like, I just turned around, you know, to be a nice guy. I, like, went to fan her because that's just, like, what I do. And this random dude, like, I didn't know who he was. I found out later she didn't know who he was. He, like, was trying to dance with her or something, and he, like, went and blocked me off and, like, pushed me away. And I was, like, oh, whatever, you know, I don't care. And she was, like, ew, dude, what the fuck, no, and, like, pushed him away. Oh, wow. And, like, grabbed me and was, like, sorry, I don't know that guy. Like, you know, that was so rude of him. And, you know, I started talking to her. I got to know her. You know, she was, like, a nice girl. Like, I wasn't yeah. trying to get anything from right, it. I right, was just right. trying to, like, help her out. But because that dude was, like, thought I was a threat or something, I don't know what he thought, but he, like, put himself out there and did something stupid. And then because of that, you know, he, like, got blocked off. And, like, yeah. there's no way that that girl was going to, like, talk to him or, yeah. like, spend any time with him afterwards, you know, like. yeah. And I, I think, too, I don't know how it is at EDM scene, but in hip-hop, there is this prevalent mentality of, like, the crab in the bucket. There can only be one. Yeah. I got to be the best rapper. You know, um, fuck everyone else. I got to be number one. Oh, okay, my, 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 my squad's, like, next, but you know, number one, but I think it's such a, it's a toxic mentality, you know? Like it really can, is. I mean, it, it's good to have healthy competition. Yeah, com- no, there's nothing wrong with competition. Like, if you're, if you're, look, at 50 Cent Kanye West, when they did their competition versus sales for, what was mm-hmm. it, um, a graduation versus... Before I self-destruct. Yeah, and so, I mean, Kanye West obviously won that, but it's not like, just because Kanye West won, that 50 Cent didn't also, like, come out, like, winning. They both made huge record sales it was good publicity for both of them Mm -hmm. because they're both trying to it was like good competition you know what i mean they weren't like out for each other's neck they were it was promotional tactics versus like some people some people don't do competition like a healthy way you know that's something that i feel like you know some people are more like they're like overly competitive in certain like fields but there's nothing wrong with competing and there's nothing wrong with like everybody getting put on you know there's no reason that right it's not like there's only ever going to be one person that makes a hit record in this right. world. If you look, there's tons of artists who have went number one, you know what I mean? But, yeah, I know, it's, it's like, 
everyone can have their own time. You yeah. know what I mean? And there's su- there's such a, I mean, hip-hop in alone mm-hmm. is so diverse now that there's something for everybody. Yeah. You know, like, one person may not like your music, but s- another person might relate to it. Yeah, if you look at, like, you know, First Amendment, you know, I know people who are, like, love that kind of music, and I know people who don't like that kind of music, but, you know, if you look at, like, over at Lord Sun's music, you know, there's people who like that right. kind of, like, the anime trap stuff, but there's also people who don't, mm-hmm. you know? It's like... In today's market, people have gotten really specific and niche with what they like. And so if you're, like, curtailing your music to a certain demographic, then the people who are out there, they'll, they'll listen to it. You know right. what I mean? It's not like you have to get... Not everyone has to be your fan. You know what I mean? Right, right. Some people, like, you know, if they like, you know, Jersey Club music, like, I personally like Jersey Club music, but I know a lot of people who aren't really into Jersey Club music. But that's not... That doesn't mean that there's not going to be people who are interested in that music mm-hmm. showing up to like a Jersey club night you know if like a famous dude from Jersey like Natus came out and performed in LA I'm sure it would be a sold out show but you know it wouldn't be sold out to the people who would be going to see Suicide Boys you know what I mean mm-hmm. like the people who that would be like a totally different thing you know it's like so even though they're not like doing the same like they don't have to be there, it's not like one of them has to be getting shine. Like they could both be throwing right. those shows at the same night, mm-hmm. and they could both have sold out theaters. Right. And they could both. Everybody could be winning. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's not like one person has to win. It's not right. like, yeah, it's not like a like a negative competition. Right. Right. I agree, man. Um, so you also rap though. Yeah, boys got bars. You know. I've I've, I've heard them. Yeah, London you freestyle. Boy. Yeah, you know, I've been, I've been doing that for before really I started making beats honestly like mm-hmm. I was rapping first but then as I like progressed you know I like to think of myself as like a producer DJ chef rapper you know what I mean you, like you're a cook oh bro I, I think that's like up. a snap so you were cooking with your dog yeah dude I cook I've been like my chef game is like my beat game mm. in that I only kick up I only cook up heat you know okay what I mean? okay like, yeah like uh it's. I feel like there's a lot of like similarities between like m- music and like production and like cooking and like sh- you know being a chef. There's like a lot of like parallels. Mm-hmm. Whereas like if you take quality ingredients and if you like follow the right steps, you know you process them a certain way, you're gonna get a good end result. Whereas if you start off with like bad quality ingredients, no matter how much work you do on them, you're still gonna get like a bad like end mm-hmm. product. Interesting. Yeah. What what do you like to what's your favorite things to cook? What are your favorite dishes? Mm. I really like Indian food and I really like a- Asian food. So you know, cook up some lamb vindaloo with the basmati rice. Okay. You know, got the garlic naan in there. Wow. You know, we got the chicken tikka masala popping off. You Damn. Know, if I'm making some Indian food, then you know, uh, when it comes down to like Asian food, I'm like really like the kind of that kind of Asian food I make is more like. Uh, like kind of like you know just like basic like beef bowl kind of stuff mm-hmm. i've always been a fan of like white rice um you know just like teriyaki kind of like stuff mm-hmm. nothing too crazy right. uh you know like more so like the pan express kind of like american food but but like the homemade kind of stuff you That's know what good. i mean it's not like really like uh i don't really like as much of like the oily kind of stuff mm-hmm. you know like like i like kung pao chicken you know like the, the heat you know anything with a lot of heat in it fuck with the heat yeah no miami but i like miami yeah, <laughs> yeah no i see where you get. I, yeah I, okay. I, I got that yeah it fucks with the heat but not my no I, I totally got you yeah, yeah um where can we find you on social media <laughs> hustle brand if you as you saw as long as you spell it right that's the thing is some people when i say hustle brand they they don't think of Russell Brand right. immediately. When I say it off the back, if I don't like give the backstory, they'll think my brand is named Hustle, the mm-hmm. word. So it's H U S S E L B R A N D, you know, brand. But people think it's like hustle, like the word hustle and then mm-hmm. brand, which is already a thing. They're a clothing company. That's not me. I'm not those guys. Mm-hmm. There's a dude who's been trying to jack my hustle brand name, but he doesn't have the same clout. So Ooh. if you see him, if you see a dude without clout, doesn't make EDM that's not me you know yeah. but like he doesn't he, he like posts like jokes it's like a Twitter kind of thing right. He's, he, I'm not or too worried about that but right. yeah dude Hustle Brand you know I got that EP coming out uh, still I've got the songs I've got the track list all like put together mm-hmm. I'm just trying to get the end of like the features sorted out right. trying to like uh, the artwork, I like the artwork, but I might might swap it with like uh, some new artwork. I, I think about doing limited pressing vinyls, cassettes, and CDs, but I'm not sure how many vinyls I yeah. would want to get pressed versus like how many 
would be like a sizable amount to like sell to like mm. my fan base. So I'm still like I'm hashing out all the details, you know right, what I mean? Right. I don't want to like rush into it too much because if, since I've been waiting this long anyways to put out music, I might as well wait a little bit longer to make sure everything works out and like everything's up to like the standards that I have versus just like throwing out a project and then like mm. oh, here it is, you know, it's like congratulations, you know, it's done like yeah. you know, but it's just like whatever kind of like half half ass, you know, right. hodgepodge whatever. Last question, man. So mm -hmm. What advice do you have for upcoming producers or beat makers? Honestly, uh, if you know a guy named Judge Judge Beats, shout out Judge. Uh, he's like the kind. Of, he's like the next wave for where I feel like modern producers are really going. If you look at like his production, he played at Escape this weekend. You know, he's doing like the EDM stuff too. But he also had production credits on Young Thug's last album. You know, he produced the last song. He's getting publishing. He's getting mechanical royalties. His songs are getting put into. Um, his songs are getting put into like advertisements you know so really that's like the wave uh really getting like placements uh so if you if you really want to like study if you're trying to be one of like the next gen kind of producers that are really on the come up go look at people like judge beats look at what he does look at how he handles his social media you know he's consistently posting on twitter and places like that and then or that's like the route for like the modern day like producer who is producing for artists and also makes their own music but if you're looking for like the new school EDM producer kind of wave, then I would say go check out an artist by the name of Josh Pan. He got put on by Auslo, which is like Skrillex's label. And the reason he's got like clout now is because originally there was like mystery around him. He was supposed to be like an artist collective that was 20 people. And there were all these like random like weird stories kind of things that were getting like pushed out. It was all like publicity stunts. It's really just one like dude with like dyed blonde hair. You know, he's like a total, he's a total nerd. I've met him, but uh, you know, on his social media, the way he manages it, like his Twitter is full of like all sorts of crazy like conspiracy stuff and just like super out there things. And the way he handles his social media is just like perfect. It's a perfect example of how you want to run your social media as a producer nowadays to get proper engagement and like stay relevant. You know, mm -hmm. so Josh Pan or Judge, those are two artists I would definitely suggest people look out to and just study. You know, what they're doing is exactly how you want to be doing it. Cool. Well, thank you for being on the show. You thank gave you, us a man. lot of uh, insightful things. Well, I learned a lot of things, man. Thank you very much, man. Of course. Appreciate it. I'll see you guys next time. Thank you.